Welcome to this short lecture on corporate activism in times of war. My name is Laura Marie Edinger Schoens, and I'm a professor of sustainable business at the University of Mannheim. The guiding questions for this lecture are the following What does corporate sociopolitical activism, CSA, refer to? What are forms of CSA, and how is it perceived by a firm's stakeholders? And how does CSA relate to how corporations currently react to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Since a couple of years, we can observe that corporations and their CEOs increasingly speak out about controversial sociopolitical issues like abortion or gun control. And this phenomenon is sometimes also referred to as woke capitalism. CSA refers to a company's representatives personal and public expression of a stance on some matter of current social or political debate with the primary aims of visibly weighing in on some issue and influencing opinions in the espoused direction. Thus, it refers to a firm's public demonstration of support for or opposition to one side of a partisan sociopolitical issue. Partisan sociopolitical issues are thereby described as salient unresolved social matters on which societal and institutional opinion is split, thus potentially engendering acrimonious debate amongst groups. While this phenomenon has occurred very visibly in the US, it is not limited geographically. CSA is thereby different from lobbyism due to its intentionally public nature intended to attract attention. It is further typically not intended to benefit firm outcomes, but rather to further societal outcomes. CSA is also different from corporate social responsibility, CSR, because it is strictly talk. CSR refers to voluntary actions taken by firms to benefit stakeholders other than owners and may include very substantive actions such as emissions reductions, which relate to the firm's own impacts. Thus, CSA will usually involve a lower level of monetary investment compared to CSR, but it may incur significantly greater reputational risk due to the potential backlashes from various stakeholders. It is often argued that the current increase in CSA is part of a larger shift in the business world in which companies increasingly speak about their values and thus are held accountable when controversial sociopolitical issues come up. The notion of a corporate purpose or a company's reason for being or existing has moved center stage in the business world, culminating in its rearticulation by the Business Roundtable, an association of a firm's executives of leading, leading US firms. As this example of Unilever illustrates, many firms have over the last years explicitly formulated and communicated their higher purpose beyond profits. Unilever states, our purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. Some brands, as for example Ben & Jerry's, have a long history of not only having a purpose that goes beyond profits, but of engaging in socio-political activism on brand level, thereby communicating their values and using their products as carriers of socio-political messages. The issues which Ben & Jerry's has features featured in their activism are very diverse and range from the climate crisis to immigration. Another form of CSA, which has been on the rise in many parts of the world, is CEO activism, thus a public expression of a firm's most visible representative. Examples of such CEO-level activism include Dan Cathy, chief executive officer of the restaurant chain Chick-fil-A, who in 2012 announced his opposition to same-sex marriage on a radio show. Another very prominent example was Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, who in 2015 criticized religious freedom laws, which he deemed as legalizing discrimination. Further in 2016, more than 100 CEOs signed a public letter in opposition uh, of the proposed legislation in North Carolina that would limit transgender individuals' access to public bathrooms. In Germany, an interesting case is the one of Joe Kesa, CEO of Siemens, who tweeted about a statement of Alice Weidel, a member of the AFD party. And this post was really eliciting very polarized responses and led to an intensive discussion about the legitimacy of CEO activism in the German context. 
Of course, firms may engage in CSA to proactively take a leadership role on social political issues and thereby affect societal outcomes. However, they may also just be driven by stakeholder pressures. And indeed, recent opinion polls indicate that many stakeholders expect companies and their representatives to take active stands on social political issues, which go beyond their core business. While firms have historically been very hesitant to make public political statements, there now seems to be a so-called hyper-partisan climate, leading to an increased demand for firms and CEOs to speak up. In the words of Richard Edelman, brands are now being pushed to go beyond their classic business interests to become advocates. It is a new relationship between a company and a consumer where a purchase is premised on the brand's willingness to live its values, act with purpose, and if necessary, make the leap into activism. In their stakeholder alignment model, Hambrick and Wolwek argue that CEO activism, when in line with the prevailing ideology amongst the firm stakeholders, will bring about increased levels of alignment. When a CEO makes a statement, those who agree with the CEO's espoused position will experience an increased level of identification with the company and will become further engaged. The authors explain that in such a case, CEO activism may even attract new like-minded people. Those who disagree, however, will tend to distance themselves from the firm. Such stakeholders who oppose the firm's position will become all the more averse after witnessing CEO activism. The authors focus on two main groups of stakeholders, employees and customers, and consider the moderating roles of organizational ideology as well as the prevailing ideology amongst the company's customers as moderating factors. The theory also acknowledges CEO power, celebrity, and narcissism as important moderators of the main relationships. As a response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, many international firms have now cut their ties to Russia, closing down shops and stopping investments. Even many firms who initially stated to wanting to keep up their business in Russia finally had to give in to stakeholder pressures. The Ukraine Corporate Index contains a continuously updated list of firms and how they deal with the issue. So can these actions be seen as CSA? In a recent essay, which Doug Schuler and me co-authored and which was published on The Conversation, we argued that leaving Russia can be seen as a no-brainer for many companies. While of course this decision incurs significant costs for some companies, the reputational risk of maintaining the ties with Russia were prohibitively high. So why are some, forms, why are some firms more proactive in taking a stand and why do others hesitate? In a recent paper, Gupta and Briscoe argue that organizations tend to be more open or closed as a function of their members' political ideologies and that this variation can help explain firms' responses to social activism. The authors propose that when firms experience stakeholder pressure, as for example in the form of activist protests, a liberal-leaning firm will be more likely to concede to activist demands than its conservative-leaning counterparts. This is the case because its decision makers will more readily accept the interconnectedness of the firm's activities with the activists' claims. The authors find support for their proposed framework in a longitudinal sample of 558 protest events directed against Fortune 500 firms from 2001 to 2015. I would like to now present one case which was prominently featured in the German media and which illustrates how complex the decision to withdraw from Russia can be for some firms. Rittersport, a German medium-sized and family-owned chocolate producing company, initially communicated to keep up their business in Russia, which makes up roughly 10% of their sales. While the firm announced to stop advertisement and investment, so no business as usual, they argued that closing down their business activities completely would lead to a significant harm to employees and farmers in cacao supply chains. The firm explained in the statement, after weighing up all the aspects, we have decided to continue supplying the Russian market but we are not doing so to make a profit. That's why we donate any profits from our current Russian business to humanitarian aid organizations. 
stopping our deliveries to Russia would have a serious impact on us as an independent, medium-sized family business as a whole, from jobs at our production sites to the livelihoods of many cacao farmers in West Africa, Central and South America. As a reaction to their communications, the firm faced a significant backlash on social media, including a tweet by the Ukrainian ambassador in Germany, Andrei Melnik, in which he posted quadratisch praktisch blut. This can be translated as quadratic practical blood, a sarcastic reformulation of the brand's ad, quadratisch praktisch gut, quadratic practical good. This case clearly indicates that stakeholders expect firms to take an active stand in situations like the war in Ukraine. While it will be harder for some firms to carry the burden than for others, the reputational risk of staying neutral is in many cases unbearable. And thus, in times of grand challenges, crises and war, given the new role of firms, which are political and moral actors, managers will have to make tough decisions to live up to their espoused values. Now, I would like to encourage you to reflect on some questions when you hear about corporate sociopolitical activism in the future. First, can we really speak of corporate activism in cases such as firms withdrawal from Russia? When are companies merely reacting to stakeholder pressure? And which motives might lead firms to take a certain stand? Second, in the criticism of companies like Rittersport, do you think this criticism is justified? Which responsibilities do companies have in times of war? And third, what can help legitimize corporate actions in times of war? So for example, could an increased level of engagement with key stakeholders help firms to steer through such times? And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>